At the outset of tonight's event, I told you this was a historic date for Dianetics and Scientology, an actual turning point in our history. And now I'm going to tell you why. <laughs> Have you ever wondered how exactly we're going to preserve standard tech into the future so that your children, their children, and their children's children will apply Dianetics and Scientology exactly as LRH intended? Have you ever wondered how exactly we're going to make a multitude of full OTs this lifetime? And have you ever wondered how you can become an absolutely flubless auditor to not only free others, but bring yourself up to full OT? Well, those questions will now be answered. What I'm about to tell you has everything to do with the future of Dianetics and Scientology, with the future of this planet, and with your future in native state. Because when we speak of the future, we're talking about auditing. And now I'm going to tell you how, from this point forward, we can make anyone into a flubless auditor in any academy in the world. And I repeat, flubless, not pretty good, not better than he was before. No, I'm talking about better than you've ever seen. And when I have finished tonight, you will know this for yourself with utter certainty. Why? Because we have new technical programs that will make the words flubless and perfect an absolute reality for each and every one of you as auditors. And yes, I guarantee this. Let me tell you how. In RTC, we are strictly concerned with the standard application of the tech. Our name is synonymous with KSW, keeping Scientology working. Our purpose, as given by LRH, is to protect the public and to make sure that the powerful technology of Dianetics and Scientology remains in good hands and is properly used. LRH created RTC as a body entirely independent of any other organization or management so we could work without distraction to achieve that purpose. For the last several years, you've heard how RTC has been spearheading the drive to keep Scientology working, and particularly as regards points one, two, and three. To get in these points, we commenced an enormous project to verify all of LRH's writings as on source and then issued them to you. We have accomplished a massive amount in making materials available spanning the grade chart including every training and auditing action from the bottom right up to new OT8. The first three points of keeping Scientology working are, one, having the correct technology, two, knowing the technology, three, knowing it is correct. And when you add up those three points, what do you get? You get the foundation of application. And of course, application is what Scientology is all about. Which brings us to the next points of keeping Scientology working. Four, teaching correctly the correct technology. Five, applying the technology. Six, seeing that the technology is correctly applied. Seven, hammering out of existence incorrect technology. Eight, knocking out incorrect applications. Nine, closing the door on any possibility of incorrect technology. And 10, closing the door on incorrect application. Now, those points four through 10 have become the focus of tremendous attention from RTC. Because after all, now that we have all LRH materials in a pure state, it's time to bring application up to that same level of purity. In other words, our goal was to bring every auditor up to the point of delivering an unqualified, perfect session. Or, to put it another way, we want every auditor capable of auditing exactly like LRH. <laughs> Now, 
as a first step and a powerful one, we launched the Special Flag Professional TR course. This course is the same one available in all orgs, but in the case of flag, supervised by the best in the world with final passes directly from RTC Inspector Generals. In other words, it's done right and it's done tough. Next, we launched the now famous Special Flag Metering course to hone metering skills to a whole new standard. And what's that course all about? It covers the whole of metering and brings an auditor up to the point of total proficiency. Why these two programs? Because TRs and metering form the backbone of all auditing. Without TRs, there is no comm cycle. Without a meter, one can't spot the right charge or know when it's handled. Results of our programs were not only immediate, they were dramatic. As a matter of fact, the TRs and metering of these flag trainees is the world's best ever, bar none. Literally a whole new standard. Now, I realize I'm talking with auditor terms and more are about to come. But even if you aren't an auditor, as a Scientologist, the data I am telling you is important because the only way any of us make it to OT is by auditing. So for all of you non-auditors, let me point out right now that even if you don't audit, you certainly depend on one as a PC. And beyond that, to make it to OT, you have to solo audit, a fact that applies to every single OT level from here on out. So listen closely, because I'm going to tell you something very important. When you're talking the flag TRs and metering course and everything those courses accomplished in terms of technical proficiency, you're actually only talking the first two steps of a monumental technical revolution. And that's what I want to brief you on tonight. The first thing you have to know is this. LRH says, Scientology will only go as far as it works. And if we're going to salvage this planet before it's too late, our tech has got to go very far, very fast. Do you want to know exactly how far and how fast? I'll tell you. Our tech has got to be perfect. Now, to understand what we are trying to achieve, here's the second thing you must appreciate. We can bring students to flag and at great effort and great expense turn out crackerjack auditors. As a matter of fact, given the course room space here, we can now train a thousand auditors at a time. That probably sounds pretty impressive until you factor in an Earth population of 5.7 billion and growing by the day. Unfortunately, my friends, those numbers will not cut it. So while FLAG will always run the greatest training programs in the world, we simply had to start thinking bigger. Consequently, the question became this. How do we bring that same standard to every org? and not just to place a few flag caliber auditors in those orgs, but to get them actually training such auditors. And I might add hundreds of thousands of them at a higher level of competence than ever in history. How do we train them not only to sufficient quality, but quantity to actually for real clear the planet. And when you consider that goal, obviously we can't just do it here. We have to be able to do it everywhere. We must be able to make a perfect auditor in any org. We must be able to do it routinely, and we must be able to do it in such quantity that we can clear over 5 billion people. Okay, that's the goal. So, what's the problem? Let me be direct. <laughs> all of you in this audience are Scientologists, dedicated ones at that. After all, you are here at FLAG. A lot of you in the audience trained as auditors. You wanted to be a good auditor. You devoted a lot of time to it, and you're rightfully proud of your certs. All of you others who are not auditors have enough reality to know with certainty that Scientology is the path out. But how many of you are actively engaged in auditing in present time. Before you start fidgeting in your seat, 
Let me tell you, there is a reason for that, and with absolute certainty, I can tell you it's now absolutely solved. We've had several excellent training programs over the years. We have tough TRs and metering courses. And finally, we've got awesome LRH technical films, which do exactly what LRH intended. And that brings us to the big question. The tech films show a perfect auditor and perfect auditing. Yet, how do we bring a student in any org up to the point where he does look like a tech film? Or to phrase it another way, how do we bring each and every future auditor up to the point where he really and truly embodies standard tech? And that's the standard we're discussing tonight. Now in the past, when one talked about turning out superlative auditors, one was talking in terms of years and not just a few. Why? It seemed to some that the only way to be a perfect auditor and learn how to handle everything in a session, including anything that could possibly go wrong, was to audit and audit, making every possible mistake until finally you suffered through and made it. <laughs> the truth of the matter is, that is false data. It's not something LRH ever said, and factually, it just doesn't produce a flubless auditor. Yes, one must actually audit if one is to become a real auditor, but while engaged in auditing, LRH expected you'd be auditing correctly, not making mistakes. In fact, what one would really get after auditing hours upon hours of flubby sessions is a fully professional and practiced flubby auditor. <laughs> so, What's the solution? How do we make auditors everywhere in enough quantity to actually clear earth and so they are all flubless and perfect? In other words, standard. That's the question we had to answer. We weren't looking to just fix something or handle an outness somewhere. No. Our quest was to bring about a new standard we've never had or even approached. With the use of LRH data series tech, we engaged in a full review of all our courses and programs. We looked at the whole spectrum of Scientology training. We looked at courses and check sheets and found them to be better than any before. We looked at study tech and word clearing tech. There we found students who could be improved on application and have now devised ways to do so. But that wasn't the real barrier. Many students were quite good. The basics are totally covered. With tech films, we've established a real standard. With the pro TRs and metering courses, we have an awesome lineup. But none of these allow us to totally reach our goal. So, if it's not the courses, and it's not lack of study tech, it's not just the basics, then it must be something else. <laughs> and it is. And yes, we did find the why. Okay, what is a why? <laughs> it is an explanation of how come something is the way it is. But to be a real why, it must have a specific characteristic. LRH explains it in the data series. He says, you can really understand a real why if you realize this. A real why opens the door to a handling, LRH. Now, understand this. A why is not just an explanation of some outness. For instance, I could say, we really need to get the policy letter that describes what a course is better implemented into every org. Or I could say, every auditor must work through the entire set of technical volumes. <laughs> now, no doubt either of those orders would improve things, but neither one would necessarily achieve the ideal scene I've mentioned. After all, they aren't based on a real why. So, we were looking for the why which would open the door to a total handling and the achievement of our hope for ideal scene. Namely, the ability to make perfectly standard auditors anywhere on Earth from England to Moscow and Greenland to Antarctica and from the forests of South America to the concrete jungle of Manhattan.
And we did find the why, the reason it hasn't happened, as well as the exact one thing to do that can and will make it happen, as sure as I am standing here. The why is lack of adequate drill to produce perfection. Now, I realize that didn't cause explosions in the rafters and didn't even cause you to gasp, so let me tell you more. <laughs> there is another why, and it is a course room why. And that why is this. The blind have been leading the blind. <laughs> Okay, so what does that mean? <laughs> After all, all students do drill, and most are pretty serious about it. Yes, I know. So let me now back up and unfold this story for you and tell you how we handled this with authority. How skilled does an auditor have to be? LRH describes it precisely in a class eight lecture entitled Standard Tech Defined. He compares the skill an auditor must have to that of a concert pianist. The pianist doesn't practice on stage. By the time he faces an audience, he doesn't even have to think of what keys to strike. It's second nature. He's done it 100,000 times. It's part of him. So when he steps on stage, he just goes up and it comes out perfect. And how does the pianist achieve that level of perfection? Through practice through drill. And that's the same way an auditor achieves perfection. Drilling, fair enough. Every student knows that datum to one degree or another. In fact, in his famous lecture, A Talk on a Basic Qual, LRH makes quite clear that flubless auditing is comprised of only three parts. One, knowledge of his materials. Two, handling misunderstoods. And three, drill. We knew we had the knowledge. It is issued and studied in packs and references. Misunderstoods are not rampant. So it must be drill. Let's look deeper. How have students been drilled? By their coaches. Who is their coach? Well, it's their twin. OK, and what is his training level? Typically, two students are on course together, and they drill each other. And so the cat fell out of the bag. <laughs> Any student is only going to receive coaching as good as his coach has studied. If you and I are drilling and you are coaching me, you will only be able to drill me to the best of your ability. If you are coaching me to run a process, you do so by making me drill the process while you bull bait me and give certain reactions that a PC might give. And once I've met your standard, I receive a pass. And that is how we discovered the why of the blind have been leading the blind. <laughs> Let me elaborate. <laughs> However hard they try, and many try very hard, a coach and student drilling in a course room tend to drill at the same level of incompetence. <laughs> they never really raise one another beyond their level of uncertainty, because they both potentially suffer the same weaknesses, they never really challenge those weaknesses in their twin. Yet, according to LRH, that is what drilling is all about. Let me give an example. Imagine learning to drive. Imagine neither you nor your twin know how to drive. <laughs> As a coach, you might make him drive around the streets of the neighborhood. But if you didn't know how to drive, and it was also his first time, do you honestly think you'd tell him to go out on the Santa Monica freeway with traffic going at 85 miles an hour? And even if you did, you'd be too scared to tell him what to do anyway. <laughs> That's what we have and why coaches weren't challenging their student twins. Yes, you say, but that's how it's been done for years and we've had many fine auditors. True. But remember what I said. We want to achieve the ability to make perfect auditors anywhere on Earth. And on that count, we unquestionably can improve. What's the solution? 
One could say we simply must make sure every supervisor checks out all his students. But now we get down to the practicality of the situation. How do we make every student get souped by a soup who's perfect on all of his auditing skills? Do we have a class 12 soup for each course room? That won't work. Certainly, we could never train class 12s for every course room. Even if we did, he'd have to watch every part of every drill by every student to make sure students have really drilled everything. That means we need a class 12 soup for every two students in every course room on earth. Not to mention the fact that if students start relying on the personal experience of their supervisors, you're opening the door to a very dark place called verbal tech. LRH makes clear that supervisors need to be trained in supervisor tech. They are not teachers. And if we require such close examination of every student on his every check sheet item, we'll never make it. The fact is the only way we can possibly train the volume of auditors needed to clear the planet is with students twinning and coaching each other. And that's not all. They have to be perfect. Imagine. You're a pre-OT on a super high OT level. You're 80 trillion years down the track, locked in the mother of all incidents. <laughs> Don't you want to be sure your auditor knows the next command? <laughs> Especially since that auditor is you. <laughs> but if I haven't made it all impossible yet, then let me add one more item to the equation. What is the ideal scene for a coach? If one wanted to have the best coaching possible, what would it be? Well, of course, it would be LRH himself. And while this is obviously impossible, it was only by envisioning this ideal scene that we solved the problem. Just imagine it for a moment. Here's a coach who has the answer to every conceivable problem you could ever encounter as an auditor. Because after all, he wrote the HCOBs that contain all those answers. Not only that, and listen carefully now, he could drill you to a point of unshakable certainty. After all, he has a total mastery of the tech. Since he knows everything about the mind, he could drill you on any possible auditing scenario and the right handling. Why would this be so perfect? Because, number one, you'd know that every critique you received was on source. After all, source is giving it. Number two, it wouldn't be verbal tech or hidden data. Again, it's source giving it to you. Number three, and here's where we get to total certainty. You'd be drilled on every type of thing that could happen in a session and you'd be made to handle each one correctly. After all, LRH, through his researches, developed the handling for any auditing situation and the exact auditing action for each. And finally, point number four, when you got a pass, you'd know you knew it all. You would have total certainty that you were perfect because Source himself put you through the drill. Okay, well, why can LRH coach like this? Well, of course, LRH can coach like he could because he is Source and obviously has a total command of all parts of the tech. So obviously, the solution is to know every piece of tech and then be drilled on everything in every part of Scientology. Simple. <laughs> All right, how do we achieve that with auditors? Take the example of the concert pianist. Does he learn to play Beethoven by sitting down and playing something incorrectly? In other words, with somebody pointing at the piano but not giving him the written sheet music that says what to play. He just hits some notes, but they're wrong. Then playing something else, it too is incorrect. On and on and on. And his teacher just sits there and says, that's wrong. That's wrong too. <laughs> or worse, what if his teacher didn't even know himself how the song went? The student's chances of lucking into Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata are zero. No, he learns his basics, learns his scales, gradually learns more difficult scales, and ultimately gains the skill to play Beethoven. In other words, he gains the manual dexterity to move his fingers sufficiently to play the piece. 
and then he practices the actual song over and over until he has it. In this way, he can play Moonlight Sonata and whatever else he sets out to learn. Similarly, with auditing, a student learns his basics, TRs and metering. Those are the basic skills, like the pianist scales. But how then does one learn the song, or in this case, all auditing processes and actions? One could try, make a mistake, get crammed or look up a situation in the tech vols, learn about it, and drill it. Then have another session bug, find it and handle it, on and on, and maybe finally get it all after a period of years. But that's not the solution. The way one learns is by doing things correctly, and drilling does not mean making mistakes. It means learning the correct way. Obviously, to achieve our goals, we need a way for students to drill all auditing skills to perfection. To keep it pure, we need no verbal tech. To do it in quantity, we can't require class 12 soups, but need students to be able to coach each other. Yet, they must reach perfection. And to do that, they have to be able to coach just like LRH. So, that's exactly what we have accomplished. Imagine if a team of people spent thousands of hours scouring through every LRH reference to locate every auditing basic, every possible session situation, and every handling for every one of them. In other words, locate every LRH datum on auditing. Imagine if they then drew up a gradient sequence of drills that covered every one of those skills and auditing scenarios. Imagine that these were written up in pre-packaged drills so students could just drill each step one by one, and the drill gave the exact right procedure. Imagine if these drills included pre-packaged coaching sheets which told the coach the exact right answer to any drilling situation. Imagine these were so detailed that a coach could know nothing, but by just reading a prepared coach sheet could see if the student was doing the exact right thing because it told the coach the exact right answer. And imagine if instead of randomly drilling, we simply drilled these fundamentals, which, in fact, cover every part of auditing. And what if coaching did not require any opinion, since the drills precisely laid out the exact procedure, and if a student drilled just those, he would know everything about auditing? And oh yes, imagine if the drills included the precise source references so any student error is instantly handled. The coach doesn't waffle around and say, I think it's covered in an HCOB I read one time, but instead can direct the student to the exact reference and his exact misunderstood. And so, the drills allow for no verbal tech and don't require a highly classed auditor to supervise them. In fact, the drills practically coach themselves, and they cover every type of auditing skill and procedure from level zero to the most advanced procedures and correction lists. Imagine all that and what you would wind up with is a progressive path of unshakable certainty and unqualified perfection, a path to a level of auditor who just knows. He sits down for a session and the tools are part of him. He's drilled them to the bone and they're second nature. He has run through them so precisely he knows them with the same level of certainty as he knows how to tie his shoes. And he has to consider his next auditing command with as much effort as he exerts remembering how to tie those shoes. Moreover, what if we had the means to make that kind of auditor every single time, not just one out of a hundred, but a hundred out of a hundred, or better yet, 10,000 out of 10,000? In other words, what if we figured out how to make each coach wear LRH's hat as a coach by putting in his hands drills that laid out for him as easily as following the dots the exact way to do it. Well, my friends, that's exactly what we have done. Ladies and gentlemen, I announce to you something that is a result of tens of thousands of hours of development and which make perfect auditors an everyday reality. 40 volumes of standard tech drills that will create a new golden age of tech.
Mike. At the heart of these drills is every technical procedure related to auditing. That includes every HCOB, every lecture, every reference to create 3,000 pages of drills covering auditing from the first time you ever handle someone's ARC break to the most advanced procedures in all auditing. And before you grow concerned that this is a long runway, <laughs> the degree to which this speeds up training will blow your mind because there will be no more questions whether you're doing it right or wrong no questions whatsoever you just drill the drill which is dead right and once you are done you are done you literally will know it in fact you are done to a standard we have never had before or at least not since LRH stood over a student's shoulder and personally coached him through it so how is this accomplished in simple terms, we have taken every auditing skill there is and worked out a gradient series of drills for each. By way of example, for every auditing procedure, such as how to run an ARC break, we have devised a five-step series of drills that bring an auditor to a level of total perfection. Not maybe, not sort of good, no, perfect. It certainly requires your participation. <laughs> but guess what? something which will be dear to your heart, it is also easy. <laughs> How did we do this? By following the famous phrase and doing what Ron said. In numerous references and tapes, LRH refers to drills and talks about creating a book of drills. In the past, some have attempted to compile such a book. But the drills they created really just gave a general instruction. For instance, drill running an ARC break. That isn't so descriptive. And really left the drill open to the coach's skill or lack of it. Take the earlier example. What if all a pianist was told was, play Moonlight Sonata? Compare that to being handed a sheet of music which told him all the right notes to play. That's the level of direction we wanted to give. We solved this by finding every reference where LRH ever referred to drilling, not just auditors, but executives, ship crews, and so forth. Clearly, none of these fit the description of blind leading the blind. Rather, they included exact and precise direction by LRH as coach. Instead of going on the basis of correcting flubs and errors, LRH's drills were always on the basis of, as he said, drills, 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 and the continuous repetition of important data. So that is what we have created. Prepared scripts of every step of every technical procedure. Just like the musician, one just goes through the drills step by step. And by just doing the drill, one learns auditing perfectly. And since every possible thing that could ever occur in a session is covered, one becomes a perfect auditor. There are many different ones, as you can see, by the number of packs. So I will give you an overview of the five different types of drills we have developed and which apply to any auditing procedure. The first gradient of these drills are called patcher drills. In Scientology, we call the questions and commands of a process its pattern. As the name implies, these drill in the actual auditing commands. LRH originally developed this type of drill to train Dianetics auditors. What this type of drill does is teach an auditor his auditing commands verbatim. It works like this. One has a list of commands for any type of auditing and seated in front of a wall, one reads from the list and says the command until he knows them all verbatim. He must know every one and be able to give them in any sequence. And we now have pattern drills for every, and I mean every single audited action. And they constitute the first gradient for every auditing skill. For instance, 
The level zero auditor is required to learn how to run an ARC break. How does he start to learn that procedure? Drilling from a list of ARC break commands delivered to a wall. He does it until he knows them all in any sequence. You can see that pattern drill here. And the auditor just recites them such as, do you have an ARC break? On the question, do you have an ARC break? Has anything been suppressed? Has anyone said you had an ARC break when you didn't have one? Was that a break in affinity, reality, communication, understanding, and so on until he knows every command related to an ARC break and can recite it in any order without reference to the written page. These sort of drills are the first step of learning any auditing action. It may not seem like much, but here you can see a copy of the drill for confessional auditing. There are nine pages of possible auditing commands, all pulled from source references, and one must know all of them verbatim to pass the drill. One just faces a wall and does it till perfect. <laughs> and what happens when there are so many students in training that we run out of wall space? There's always the Great Wall of China. <laughs> the, the point is, no one has to think about it, not the student, not the coach, not the supervisor. You do the drill and you get the EP, everyone, every time, and it's just as true for more advanced drills. Now, we call the next gradient of drills the standard tech procedure drills. That's because they teach one the standard procedure for any auditing action. How does one achieve a level of certainty on all auditing? Not so he can remember, but so he just knows it. In the class eight lecture, Standard Tech Defined, LRH describes a level of auditor certainty that's absolutely automatic. Here's what he says. Standard Tech then requires that one know his tools, know the laws of the game, know the correct action so instinctively and so instantaneously that he never has to think a thing to do it. His attention is on the PC. PC gives indicator 60, and the auditor does what he's supposed to do. Just bing. PC's talking about an air C break, but it isn't reading. Now he knows his technology sufficiently well, and he knows the PC's talking about an air C break that isn't reading. It's a missed withhold. Air C breaks that don't read are missed withholds, standard datum. You don't say, I think in a lecture, Ron said something about that and on things that didn't read. Nuts. See, it's bonkers. What's all this think and cross think and wonder and so forth? If you hold up your hand and turn your hand over palm up and then turn your hand over palm down, do you know what you had to do as a thetan? If you could think of the number of channels and muscles and nerve centers and things and so on, which it took to turn your hand right side up and upside down, you would go practically bonkers. And I assure you, you wouldn't be able to do it. LRH. All right, how do we achieve that level of certainty? The answer is with a series of drills derived from an LRH talk to class 12s. In that talk, LRH tells them how to do it. The coach feeds a question to a student auditor. He should be able to spit out the answer without hesitation and not as a test. We're not talking quizzes here. We just expect an auditor to know what to do and when without fail, without comm lag. By covering the data over and over, he gets it. So how do we make sure all data gets covered and correctly? With prepared drill scripts that list out questions for every possible auditing situation related to that type of auditing. The coach asks the student a question from the drill sheet and student gives the answer. The answer is clearly noted on the drill for the coach to see. If it is correct, they move on. If it's wrong, coach refers them to the exact reference listed right in the drill, and student clears up the MU. Once that is done, they keep on working it through, drilling and drilling until it becomes a matter of his inner core. 
Sound simple? It is. Because no matter what bugs come up, the drill tells you what to do. In fact, any inability to do the drill is handled by doing the drill itself. And the passing standard ensures no quickie. One drills until you can go from start to finish, no flubs. Some of these drills have several hundred questions. And believe me, there is no way one can make it through perfectly by chance. But the real beauty is this. Because the drills include every possible auditing scenario, one really does learn it all. And guess what? It's quick. Do these people take weeks and weeks? No way. Instead, students fly through them. Why? No goofs, no bad coaching, no false data, no Q&A. One is simply learning the correct data and every right way to do things. He literally drills standard tech and so never gets caught up in the muck of uncertainty. Now, that's a key point and let me reiterate it. These drills are so self-contained that you, all of you out in the audience, without any further training, could literally coach them. As a matter of fact, we could take someone who's not even an auditor, give them a two-minute hatting and they could coach a student to perfection, even a student on an advanced auditor course. And even when these untrained coaches gave a flunk for an incorrect answer, they'd be right. The drills are so specific that even if the student was a trained auditor, he wouldn't even bother arguing with his untrained coach because the flunk would have come right from a source reference. Sound incredible? The only way to really comprehend what I'm talking about is to do it or see it. So let me make it graphic with the following video. Hello, how are you? Hello, I'm fine, thank you. Excellent. Now, what I want you to do is coach a student auditor on how to properly handle an ARC brake rudiment, okay? Yes, sir. Good. From this pack, read him the questions that are written in black. The correct answer is printed in red right beneath that. If he gives you the right answer, acknowledge him and go to the next question. If the answer is wrong, you flunk him and have him study the LRH reference which is given right below the answer. Okay. Once he's cleared up his misunderstoods, carry on with the drilling from the point he flunked. Keep going through the drills until he can answer every question correctly in the entire pack, all the way through, without a flunk. Okay. When he does that, give him a pass. Got it? Yes. Very good. So, what uh, are we going to do today? Don't worry about a thing. Just please be seated and we'll start. Sure. Ready to start? Yeah, sure, let's go. Start of drill. You start a session as first action, check the ARC brake root, it reaches the fall. What do you do? Take up the rudiment. Good. The PC answers is yes. He does have an ARC brake. What do you do? Get the data on it briefly. Good. The PC tells about the ARC brake. What do you do? Find out by assessment which point the ARC brake occurred on. Good. What do you say? Was that a break in affinity? Reality, communication, understanding. Good. The assessment reads on communication with the fall. What do you do? Check it with the PC. Good. The PC replies that he feels this is a break in ARC, not a break in communication, and does not understand why this assessment is being done. What do you do? I would indicate it was a break in ARC. Flunk! Correct answers. Clear the ARC break assessment procedure with the PC so he understands it. Here's the reference. The coach ensures the student restudies the reference, clearing his misunderstoods until he fully understands it. Then they begin again at the question he flunked 
and carry forward with the drill. We start Joe. The PC replies that he feels this is a break in ARC, not a break in communication, and does not understand why this assessment is being done. What do you do? Clear the ARC break assessment procedure with the PC so he understands it. Very good. After clearing up the action of ARC break assessment, the PC says that he gets how this works, but is not totally sure. They continue with the drill, page after page, with the coach asking questions from the drill pack and making sure the student's answers are correct. On each flunk, they clear up any misunderstoods to ensure the auditor fully understands the LRH reference. They carry on doing this over and over again until he can do it all the way through the pack, from start to finish, with no flunks. Everything that could possibly happen while running an ARC break is covered, from the most fundamental to the most difficult. You asked for an earlier similar ARC break. The PC says no and the question does not read. You check if there's any more to his last answer and he says no. You put in the suppress button on the earlier similar question and it does not read. You check and validate, no read. Then you check careful, fail to reveal anxious about and protest, no reads. Then you check not is, abandoned and misunderstood, no reads. You check for a bypass suffered that didn't read. You check for a recession, miswithhold, and no read. What do you do? You direct the PC's attention to a charged area from the last ARC break that was run and find out if there's anything more on that area. Cool. Pass. <gasps> yes! So yes, these new standard tech procedure drills do make it possible for anyone to drill a student to the point of certainty. The key is that every important datum for every technical procedure is included and so all the coach need do is ask the questions and make sure the answers are as listed. Now imagine there are drills like this for every single auditing skill. Literally each one has been mapped out in a drill that gives an auditor total certainty. Now the wins from those completing these drills are in a truly stellar range. They learned all the drills to perfection and they did know the answers. So guess how good they were when they went in session? Perfect? Actually, they were mediocre. Why? Because these drills take them up to a level of totally knowing about and ready to apply which leads us to the next step. You see, there was still another gradient to bridge from the reality of the course room drilling with your gung-ho friends to the reality of a session with a keyed-in PC. <laughs> in other words, just as LRH says, there's a big gap between knowing the tech and facing a PC with full-blown dramatization and a fully active meter. And that's the final gap we had to bridge. In fact, everything I've just told you is but a fraction of the drilling breakthrough I'm about to announce. Yes, every one of those previous steps are vital, but they all lead to this one. Now in the past, coaches have attempted to imitate a session in all meter phenomena, showing e-meter reads with a pencil, <laughs> or a big mock-up of a needle dial, or even simulate it by squeezing the cans. Such actions do have their use, especially in asking a student to demonstrate what a meter reaction would look like. But when it comes to drilling and auditing skill, 
It's ultimately like telling a student driver who's seated in a parking lot to mock up the idea of heavy freeway traffic as you bark out things to him. Stop sign, hit the brakes, look out, car coming your lane, what now? And seeing how he reacts while sitting in a parked car. Yes, he may learn the answers and not have to think about it, but if you then, without further drilling and without ever taking him down a nice, quiet street to practice at 15 miles per hour, stick him in front of a Mack truck barreling down at 75 miles per hour, he may have a problem. <laughs> and that's something that could happen to a student auditor when giving his first session. So what's the proper gradient? How do we drill a session without having to go in session? How do we have a student take everything he's learned, his TRs, his meter drills, his theory, his pattern, his knowledge of all procedure, and then actually drill all of these together with the student having to give commands, get responses, give the right acknowledgement and the correct next command while doing admin and actually using the meter? Not being told, oh, that's a read, but actually seeing it. The answer is what we call a session drill. And just as the name implies, it's as close to a session as you can possibly get. It presents the student with all session factors simultaneously, including real meter reads. After all, that has been the breakdown in the past. How do you really teach an auditor to follow down an exact read and be able to recognize an exact read within an eighth of an inch as different from another? How do we teach him to actually see it while performing all parts of a session? How do we do it? <laughs> Let's return to our course room scenario. Student and coach face one another in a practical room. Student asks a question, looks down at his meter and sees, not a pencil or a can squeezed read, but the real thing. And where does that read come from? Let me introduce you to a revolutionary new tool for the training of all future auditors, the Hubbard E-Meter Drills Simulator. The name Drill Simulator is entirely accurate. Stored in its computer memory is every manner of needle reaction and meter phenomena. Falls, rises, theta bops, rock slams, rocket reads, floating needles, and more, all of it ready for display at the touch of a button. And here's how it works. This simulator is used with the final gradient of drills called session drills. And what these are is a fully packaged and exactly scripted drill of an actual session. Coach and student are drilling a session from a prepared script. Everything about it is real. The reactions the coach presents and the problems that arise, all real. But as part of that drill, we've also inserted real meter reads. In other words, at precisely indicated points on the script, the coach employs the drills simulator, and suddenly the student is looking at real meter phenomena. So instead of having two people just coach each other, we've written a total prepared drill, which is a real session. And what this means to auditor training is practically indescribable. But here's a video that will convey just some of the magnitude of this training breakthrough and what it will mean to auditor training from this point forward. This is the new Hubbard E-Meter Drill Simulator. When you turn it on, it runs through its own computerized startup procedure. In session, you begin with the can squeeze. So with the simulator, 
The first step is to calibrate your meter precisely to the computerized can squeeze of the simulator. The keypad has a series of buttons, each one representing a different read. For example, by pushing this button, you get a one quarter inch small fall. You can also produce a one inch fall or a three inch fall, as well as many sizes in between. For ease of use by coaches, the keypad is color coded to group different types of reads. For example, all falls are outlined in blue. The buttons for rises are purple. And here you can see a rise. This is a tick. You can produce many other types of reads, including a rocket read, a dirty needle, a rock slam, a still needle, and even a floating needle. In fact, there are many different sizes of FNs. There are some instances where an auditor has to be able to spot reads while the needle is floating. This is called reading through an FN. Previously, there was no way to teach an auditor how to do this. But the simulator now makes it possible to drill this skill. Here you can see a floating needle, and that was a read in the middle of the FN. Note, the FN continues after the read. And there's another read. With practice, the auditor never misses. Another ability an auditor must master is finding duplicate reads. With the simulator, you can establish the original read, which in this case is a one and three quarter inch fall. That exact read is then put into memory so it can be recalled at any later point. The auditor is then drilled to be able to find that exact same read again. Was it this one? Or was it this one? Just by hitting the original read button, we know it was that one. And with no student and coach argument. In practically any session, the needle isn't just stuck on the dial, it's moving around. With the simulator, the coach can set the needle to move constantly in any of a number of patterns. He can set a clean pattern or a dirty needle pattern, making it possible to train auditors to spot reads through the PC's needle pattern. And we can also adjust the TA to simulate the pre-clear's tone arm going up or down in session. Prior to using the simulator in an auditing drill, one first learns exactly how to operate it. There is a manual for the simulator and it contains a series of drills that teach the student how to create realistic situations just like those that happen in session. In other words, the drill drills one on how to drill with the simulator. For instance, the student must learn how to create an instant read, which is that reaction of the needle which occurs at the precise end of any major thought voiced by the auditor. Apples, pears, oranges, and so auditors are taught how to spot reads correctly. Now let's see what an actual drill looks like. The coach has the drill simulator and a drills pack, which tells him precisely what to do each step of the drill. He just follows the instructions and ensures the student responds exactly per the scripted drill. For this demonstration, they are going to fly the ARC brake rudiment. The CS is to fly a rude. Okay. Start of drill. 
Do you have an A or C break? The script instructs the coach to produce a one-inch fall on the next question. On the question, do you have an A or C break? Has anything been suppressed? Do you have an A or C break? Um, yeah, I, I do actually. Uh, this morning I found my canary dead and I took a little bit of a loss on that. Thank you. Was that a break in affinity? Reality? Communication? Understanding? Was that a break in understanding? Yeah, yeah, it was a break in understanding. Thank you. I'd like to indicate... Every meter read the coach is to produce using the drill simulator is specifically called for in the script. Was it curious about understanding? Desired understanding? Enforced understanding? Inhibited understanding? No understanding? Refused understanding? Was it no understanding? Flunk. That's it. You should have said, was it enforced understanding? That's the longest read. See here? The coach refers the student to the exact source reference, which is given right in the script. Together, they clear up the student's misunderstoods. And then, they return to the drill at the same spot and continue. Was it curious about understanding? Desired understanding? Enforced understanding? Inhibited understanding? No understanding? Refused understanding? Was it enforced understanding? Yes, it was. Thank you. Is there an earlier similar ARC break? Flunk. That's it. You should have indicated it was enforced understanding. Uh... These drills cover every type of situation that could possibly happen compiled from every LRH written reference and tape lecture related to the technical procedure being drilled. By the time these students have gotten through this level of drilling and can do it flawlessly, they have a total command of that technical procedure. Therefore, we no longer have a case of the blind leading the blind. And that leads us to the toughest gradient, the trained training the hell out of the train. The final drill on any technical procedure is totally bull baited with full use of the read simulator and full use of PC indicators. The result is a drill that's as close to a real session as you could possibly get. And here's how it looks. Here we go. Start of drill. Do you have an ARC break? Do you have an ARC break? The coach established an original read, a one-inch fall. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do, actually. Um, the other day, my, my boss called me into his office. Um, it, he wanted me to, to put on a dinner party for a, a key client of his. <laughs> Dirty needle. I couldn't believe it. I mean, how demeaning. Ugh, what a pig that guy is. All right. Has your boss missed a withhold on you? No. No way. All right. What did you think of when I asked you the question? I don't know. I mean, that, that must have been a false read. I, I, I think you should just check false. OK. Is there something you're not saying? What's that right there? Mm. All right, I'll, I'll look. The coach can try to throw off the student with many wrong reads, and the student has to spot the right one. Right there. What did you just think of? Oh, that. Um, well, when I first moved into town, um, I had my, uh, my boss and his wife over for dinner. Well, then his wife just started badgering me for my recipe. Well, I, I guess the, the overt is that, um, you know, I, I said I'd give it to her, and then I never did. All right. When was it? Um, hmm. That was about uh, four weeks ago. Okay. Is that all of the withhold? Yes, absolutely.
The dirty needle right. indicates there's more. Is there something else to this withhold? What's that? Ugh. Well, she went and told a, a whole bunch of other people uh, about my cooking. <sighs> well, it, it got so out of hand that the local paper called me to get the recipe for the society page. Ugh. Well, I wouldn't give it to them either. TA made to rise, just like a real session. Is that all of the withhold? Yes. All right. Have you justified that over it? Uh, well, uh, you know, I, I, I was new in town, and uh, I didn't want to come across as a show-off. I got it. How else did you justify it? Um, that's, that's it, actually. Okay. Who missed it? Um, my, my boss, he missed it. Um, he asked if I'd um, given the recipe to his wife. I got it. Who else missed it? That, that's it, actually. <laughs> no one else missed it. Boy, I'm glad that's out of the way. <laughs> I, I guess we can just um, move on to that next process, right? Thank you. Did you think of anything else to do with this overt? What's that? <sighs> nothing. <sighs> Absolutely nothing. I, I, actually, I, I, I'm feeling very offending on this. All right. Did you have another thought about this overt? Right there. <gasps> nothing. Nothing. All right. Still needle. Something not said. Did you suppress what you thought of? Did you invalidate what you thought of? Is there something you're being careful of? Is there something you're being careful of? No. Look, I don't think I had a withhold in the first place, all right? Just get off my back. All right. I'll repeat the audit in question. Is there something you're being careful of? More reads other than the original. That. That? Mm-hmm. Well, my boss um, complimented me on uh, what a wonderful cook I was. Well, but it, it wasn't my recipe in the first place. You know, you're uh, really sharp with that meter. I never thought I'd tell anyone that one. Thank you. Is there anything else to this withhold? What was that thought? Well, all right. I, I was trying to impress him. He told me that the food was almost as good as that fancy French restaurant, Le Cordon Bleu. Okay. And, well, it was. That's where I got it. I, I catered it in and I passed it off as my own. That, that's what I was withholding. Thank you. Your needle is floating. Pass. So there you have it. The new Hubbard E-Meter Drill Simulator and the drills that will change the face of auditor training forever. And with these self-contained drills, we have achieved the apparently unachievable. A perfect drill incapable of being altruized and which results in total certainty of the auditing skill being drilled because it contains every single thing Source ever said about that skill. 
And would you like to know how good auditors were after completing this final drill? Perfect. Absolutely 100% standard and perfect, period. Now, don't be overwhelmed by the volume of these drills. As is the case with any real solution, it is actually quite simple. A full chart showing the entire body of drills will be available. In simple terms, one simply does this exact gradient of drills for each different type of auditing skill. For instance, to learn how to handle the rudiments, the first step is the ARC break. One does each drill I have described in sequence, pattern drill to learn the precise commands, the standard tech procedure drill to gain a total command of everything to do with ARC breaks, and finally, the session drills using the read simulator. Once one has completed those steps, he knows how to run an ARC break. How well? He knows everything about it. And this is the exact procedure for all auditing skills. For instance, drills exist for the rest of the rules, problems, withhold, and so forth, continuing on to every auditing skill, including all types of processing levels, from grades to new era Dianetics, on to advanced actions such as confessionals and false purpose rundown, specialized rundowns, and all the way up to the handling of correction lists with drills that cover every line on every correction list. Yes, drills exist for every possible auditing action. One just does the different drills for each skill and gains total certainty on each. At the end of this entire lineup, an auditor knows how to audit everything. But to clear the planet, we need to reach all peoples of Earth. The work that has gone into the new drills has been nothing short of monumental. We are talking about hundreds of Sea Org members working with the LRH Technical Research and Compilations Unit of the Senior CS Int Office, culling all source references for nearly 4,000 pages of drills. We are talking 13 printing presses, all run by CIRG members and all operating simultaneously for weeks on end. We are talking hundreds of typesetters, proofreaders, laminators, and collators working around the clock. When you do these drills, you will see we even used a newly patented ring binder to put these packs together in a form that they will last forever. Now, all of that sounds pretty spectacular, and it is, but there is something else very important. While all of this production has been ongoing, the largest translation team in history was assembled. This includes literally hundreds of translators, both staff and public, who have been working day and night to translate these drills. And thanks to their dedicated efforts, I am proud to announce these drills are also being released to you tonight in German, French, Spanish, Italian, Swedish, Danish, Dutch, Portuguese, Norwegian, Hebrew, and Japanese. Here they are. With all languages combined, this equates to 44,000 pages of drills. So now let me put all of this together so you can see how all of this works and how it revolutionizes all training. Factually, we have applied our drilling breakthroughs to all training levels and not in a theoretical ivory tower, no way. For months, these drills have been in practice at all levels. Let me explain. The gray chart maps the road to freedom. So let's start at the first step. That is the student hat. And we applied our breakthrough on drilling to the student hat. 
Drills were devised that drill in literally every part of study tech from the three barriers of study to all word clearing. We even compiled drills that drill one on how to give checkouts. Nothing changes in study tech. You just drill it in to perfection. And when you get through these drills, study tech is part of your inner soul. <laughs> the students who have gone through these drills are an entirely new breed of student. And even though there are more course materials, new students doing the student hat for the first time went through faster than any previous students in history. So we have added study drills to the student hat and let me now announce to you the international release of the new student hat course including all new drills in 12 languages, French, Italian, German, Spanish, Danish, Dutch, Swedish, Norwegian, Portuguese, Hebrew, and Japanese. That brings us to the next training level, the professional TR course and upper indoctrination TR course. While TRs, of course, remain the same, even here we have news. Why are we able to get such better results at FLAG? Because the course is run exactly as LRH intended. Drilling is already the keynote of these TR courses. While researching these new drills, we discovered an LRH HCOB redefining TRs, which was never issued. It is now, here you can see HCOB, definition of TRs, and it says, definition of TRs, methods of drilling the COM formula and becoming expert in its handling and use, LRH. To improve the performance of all TR students internationally, the LRH Technical Research and Compilations Unit conducted an exhaustive research to locate every single critique LRH ever gave while coaching students on their TRs and to teach all supervisors to critique TRs just like LRH, I am also proud to announce the release of a new HCOB that contains them all critiquing TRs. And there you can see it. The next step in auditor training is metering. As I described, this course, which has only been available at FLAG, has been very successful. And it is just as vital as ever. After all, all of the new standard tech drills I have described tonight require one to already have his TRs and metering in. And with our latest breakthroughs, we have been able to greatly improve even this course. On the metering course, students study the full theory of metering including all LRH references and the basic metering books and now we drill them on that theory with pre-packaged drills until they know it cold the result when they see a meter phenomena they know exactly what's happened with that PC and his mind no thinking about it no Q&A no com lag they just know it and there's even more good news as a result, students are now completing the course 80% faster. It's a breakthrough of magnitude, and so this course now becomes a permanent part of auditor training everywhere. I give you the international release of the all-new Hubbard Professional Metering course in English, French, Italian, German, and Spanish. Yet everything I've just described to you are just the preliminaries. <laughs> As is clear, the centerpiece of this new program is the 40 volumes of drills that teach auditors every type of auditing skill. And all of this was done with the entire auditor classification training lineup in mind. 
and to give you this tech, every auditor training check sheet from the academy level zero to four to class five new era Dianetics to class five grad, as well as the St. Hill special briefing course have been totally updated and revised to incorporate all of these new drills and every single one of those check sheets are being released at flag tonight. Okay, but what about all those who have already trained? You'll remember at the beginning of this talk I stated I knew why you had stopped auditing. Well, surveys show auditors stopped auditing because of uncertainty. Almost uniformly, they state they lacked certainty. And I'm telling you right now, I guarantee you, any one of those weaknesses are definitely now resolved with these drills. In fact, these drills will even detect the misunderstoods you didn't know you had. <laughs> Up till now, if you couldn't get something right or there was something you felt you misunderstood, you could search through references and hope to sort it out. Now, by simply doing the drill, if you get to a step you can't do, like a laser, you will be pointed to the exact HCOB you missed on and you'll find your misunderstood every time right then. How quick? In seconds. So yes, when you look at planetary clearing, we not only have the means for every org to make perfect auditors, we have the means to do it in a fraction of the time previously imagined. And so, here's the next part of this evolution. In addition to the new auditor course check sheets I just described, an additional brand new series of courses have been created. These are courses for already trained auditors. They are available to such auditors regardless of when they trained. If one holds a certificate, even if not interned, he qualifies. These courses include every technical training film, so you really learn all parts of TRs and metering and what auditing looks like. And then, most relevant to this evening's topic, these courses put you through all of the drills I have just described from beginning to end up to your level of certification, making you into a fully standard, perfect, new generation auditor. And so I proudly announce the release of the all new certainty courses for student hat level 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, grad 5 and the SHSBC. Now, now you may wonder, what does all of this training mean to internships? Frankly, it brings us back to what LRH always intended. As he explains in CS Series 52, a course graduate becomes an auditor by auditing, LRH. In other words, internships are where an auditor actually audits. He is supposed to have learned his tech on course and then by auditing in the chair. There is a gradient just above our final drill, and that is auditing with a real PC. <laughs> but thanks to these drills, instead of taking months or a year, internships will take but a few weeks, just as LRH intended. Now, all of that is pretty impressive, huh? Yeah. You won't believe it, but there is even another technical release that is just as important as everything I have just told you about. As you may have gathered, we are very, very, very serious about clearing this planet. And to do that, tech must be standard. I have just described to you how we can make a new generation of auditor that is perfect. And it is true. So how can we even further improve results beyond that I've described? After all, I am talking about auditors with perfect TRs, perfect metering, and who are total masters of the tech and every auditing action and process. Well, as you know, there is one key item that without it, 
the making of OTs would not be possible. And that is the E-meter. After all, to erase one's bank and handle his case, he must first locate what to handle. And there's another important datum you may not have known. As one moves up the levels, his dependency on the meter to locate the right parts of his case to run increases. In fact, as you go higher and higher, there are many things you have to find by meter alone. No PC indicators, no, I feel it might be this, or when I was young, my mother said such and such. At the highest levels, you are dealing with parts of the track that are much, much earlier than mama. <laughs> and to find it, you need the meter. So you'd better be good and so better your meter. Over the years, there have been many advances in metering. Back in the 1950s, meters used vacuum tubes, much like the early generation computers. Then in the 60s came the first transistorized meter, much more compact and accurate. These gave us the first standard meters, the Mark IV and Mark V. In the late 1970s, to advance metering, LRH had designed the new Mark VI e-meter. Later, in the mid-1980s, came the Mark Super 7, again including even further advances and refinements directed by LRH. All in all, the Mark VII is by far the finest meter ever. However, there was still one LRH meter design criteria we weren't able to achieve. LRH described this as a meter with a variable sensitivity that would automatically compensate for increased resistance in the PC caused by the mass of his reactive mind moving in on him. It would put auditing into a whole new realm. As LRH said, if such a meter ever became a reality, it would allow an auditor to locate charge on an overwhelmed PC with the mass of his entire bank bearing down on him just as easily as on a PC totally keyed out and his life rude totally in. But most importantly, it would give an OT the ability to look right down his track to that incident 80 trillion years ago. And why? because such a meter wouldn't just indicate such incidents with the tick of a needle. Instead, the needle would move so hard it would sledgehammer the pin on the meter dial. In other words, LRH described a meter that would make it possible for not just he, but any solo auditor to unlock his whole track with total certainty. In other words, such a meter would be a real OT meter. Unfortunately, with the technology at the time, this perfected meter simply could not be produced. But technology has advanced, and after a year of intensive research and development, we were able to create exactly what LRH intended. I now bring you the brand new Hubbard Professional Mark Super 7 Quantum E-Meter. Notice we didn't give it a new number. If we had, we would have called it the Mark 1000. So instead, we called it a quantum. How advanced is this meter? I'll tell you. If you were to take every improvement in metering since the first one in the 1950s, all the way up to the present time, and combine all those improvements into one, they still don't make up even a fraction of how much this meter is advanced. Yes, its value to auditing is significant. And combined with everything else I have told you tonight, this truly does move auditing into a level that is mind-boggling. Of course, this all sounds quite technical, so I have prepared a video showing a practical demonstration of exactly how advanced this meter is and what it means to auditing. Here it is. The discovery of the meter, as LRH said, is what made clearing and OT possible. 
There have been many advances in metering over the years, and all of them have been to improve the meter's ability to detect charge. The breakthrough of the quantum meter is that it has a fully computerized, self-adjusting, automatically compensating sensitivity. This means you get bigger reads than you ever thought possible, allowing you to always locate the correct charge. The problem with all meters, prior to the Mark Super 7 Quantum, is that as the tone arm moved, the size of reads changed. Here's why. The meter puts out a tiny electrical current which is passed through the body. Changes in the preclear affect this electrical current, resulting in reads on the meter. As mass moves in on the preclear, the resistance to the electrical current increases. To compensate for the increased resistance, the tone arm is raised, increasing the electrical flow. But due to the added resistance, reads are smaller. Factually, the amount of preclear resistance at tone arm 5.0 is 11 times greater than the resistance at 2.0. And so, reads are 11 times smaller at TA 5.0. This is true of every meter model prior to the quantum. Here is a Mark Super 7 which has been properly adjusted for the correct PC sensitivity with a can squeeze. Do you like apples? But as the tone arm rises, resistance increases. Do you like apples? Note how the increased resistance changes the size of reeds. Do you like apples? Do you like apples? Each reed was smaller. And here's what happens when the resistance decreases and the TA goes lower. Do you like apples? That read was bigger than the original. Now, let's repeat this same demonstration with the quantum. Here again is the original read. Do you like oranges? When the TA goes higher, the size of read stays the same. Do you like oranges? Do you like oranges? And reeds are exactly the same size even when the TA goes lower. Do you like oranges? All reeds at any TA are exactly the same. This is because the quantum automatically adjusts its sensitivity to compensate for the increase and decrease of the tone arm throughout the session. As the tone arm rises, so does the sensitivity. And it adjusts the exact amount necessary to compensate for the increase or decrease in the resistance of the PC. So, what does this mean to an auditing session? Using the meter, the auditor locates the charge to be handled, and it's vital for an auditor to be able to spot the exact same charge again and again to really handle it. This side-by-side -side comparison makes the point. The size of reads has not been exaggerated. After setting the sensitivity for the PC, both meters show the same read on the charged subject. Has an engram been re-stimulated? But now, look what happens as mass begins to move in on the PC. The tone arm goes up. The PC still hasn't spotted it. More mass comes in on the PC. The tone arm goes higher still. Now, compare reads when the same incident appears again. That. Again, the size of reads has not been exaggerated. That. And now you know why we call this meter a quantum. Its reads are huge.
allowing the auditor and preclear to spot charge that might otherwise have been totally missed. And that means everything in auditing. If all that isn't enough, consider its value in solo auditing, locating the exact charge on your case from the first moment you ever had one. The quantum never misses a read. And its ability to show those reads to an auditor is a quantum leap beyond anything we have ever had. The new Hubbard Professional Mark Super 7 Quantum E-Meter. LRH's dream of an OT meter, now a reality. So there you have it, the new Mark Super 7 Quantum E-Meter. And I assure you, once you've used one or been audited on one, you won't ever want to do without. As an auditor, you not only will always get the right read, you will also have total certainty that you'll find that right read. And as a PC, not only will you find the right charge, you will have total certainty your auditor will see it. <laughs> and while this new meter is available tonight, there is even more good news. We want everyone to achieve standard auditing results, and this meter plays no small part in those results. In developing this meter, a major design criteria was that this advance could be added to any Mark Super 7. So yes, all of you Mark 7 owners will be able to have your meter upgraded to a Quantum. And for those on lines here at the FSO, yes, all your auditors do have them. <laughs> now, what does all of this mean? It means our courses are nothing short of awesome. You get all the tech and you learn how to apply it. Thanks to our efforts in recent years, you now have 100% on source materials. Your packs include every LRH reference for its level, 100% standard. You have LRH lectures reproduced with clear sound, so it sounds like you are right there with LRH. With the tech films, you have a visual standard of exactly how auditing looks. So you have the knowledge right down to every vital word. And now we have brought the doing this to the same level. And what does that do for speed of training? In two words, greased lightning. Why? No floundering, no waffling around, no trying to figure it out. You simply do the theory and do the drills and you've got it. And when combined with the new quantum meter, you wind up with a scenario that spells total success. Everything I have listed for you is wonderful and will make for a perfect auditor. But as always, it has to be applied. And that is what this latest project was about to somehow, anyhow, bring technical application up to a point where we could clear the planet. Everything was in preparation for the step you heard about tonight. They are all pieces of the big picture. And when you add them all together, you are suddenly looking at this planet from a whole new perspective, not as a sprawling mass of five billion people who somehow have to be handled one by one. No, 
you're looking at this planet with the same level of certainty and confidence that any of our new generation auditors would look at an individual PC. Earth is in trouble, we know the tech, so what are we waiting for? Let's handle it. So from this point forward, the moment you step into a Scientology Academy, you're not just enrolling on a course. You are enrolling in a genuinely historic event, the first of a new breed of auditor, the likes of which have never been seen before. And more than that, and I mean this very literally, you will be enrolling in your own eternity. Because as we've told you again and again, the route to full OT demands superlative auditing skill. And that means you, your skill as an auditor and as a solo auditor. No matter how you look at it, you simply cannot make it to the highest level of OT without being able to audit. So, everything I've mentioned tonight does have something to do with every one of you watching this event. If you've ever had any doubts as to your ability to make it to the top, say goodbye to those doubts right now. It's simple. Get on course, do these drills, audit with the new quantum meter, and you will make it all the way to the top, the very top, period. I tell you that with total certainty, and that's why, 46 years after the release of Dianetics, I say to you tonight, welcome to the new golden age of technology. tonight's event, let there be no doubt. Scientology and its full workability is yours for the asking. You simply must reach for it. And with that, I command all of you to reach for it. It is your eternity. Again, as LRH said, Scientology will only go as far as it works. And that is why we work so hard to get in all points of keeping Scientology working. You've all read the policy before, but with the programs we've released tonight, I'm sure you'll agree that that policy takes on a whole new meaning. And in concluding, I'd like to again read you from that policy. LRH says, when somebody enrolls, consider he or she has joined up for the duration of the universe. Never permit an open-minded approach. If they're going to quit, let them quit fast. If they enrolled, they're aboard. And if they're aboard, they're here on the same terms as the rest of us, win or die in the attempt. Never let them be half-minded about being Scientologists. The finest organizations in history have been tough, dedicated organizations. Not one namby-pamby bunch of panty-waist dilettantes have ever made anything. It's a tough universe. The social veneer makes it seem mild. But only the tigers survive, and even they have a hard time. We'll survive because we are tough and are dedicated. When we do instruct somebody properly, he becomes more and more tiger. When we instruct half-mindedly and are afraid to offend, scared to enforce, we don't make students into good Scientologists, and that lets everybody down. When Mrs. Patty Cake comes to us to be taught, turn that wandering doubt in her eye into a fixed, dedicated glare, and she'll win, and we'll all win. Humor her, and we all die a little. The proper instruction attitude is, you're here, so you're a Scientologist. Now we're going to make you into an expert auditor, no matter what happens. We'd rather have you dead than incapable. 
Fit that into the economics of the situation and lack of adequate time, and you see the cross we have to bear. But we won't have to bear it forever. The bigger we get, the more economics and time we will have to do our job. And the only things which can prevent us from getting that big fast are areas in from one to 10. Keep those in mind and we'll be able to grow fast. And as we grow, our shackles will be less and less. Failing to keep one to 10 will make us grow less. So the ogre which might eat us up is not the government or the high priests. It is our possible failure to retain and practice our technology. An instructor or supervisor or executive must challenge with ferocity instances of unworkability. They must uncover what did happen, what was run, and what was done or not done. If you have one and two, having the technology and knowing the technology, you can only acquire three for all, knowing it is correct, by making sure of all the rest, teaching correctly the correct technology, applying the technology, seeing that the technology is correctly applied, hammering out of existence incorrect technology, knocking out incorrect applications, closing the door on any possibility of incorrect technology, closing the door on incorrect application. We're not playing some minor game in Scientology. It isn't cute or something to do for lack of something better. The whole agonized future of this planet, every man, woman, and child on it, and your own destiny for the next endless trillions of years depend on what you do here and now with and in Scientology. This is a deadly serious activity. And if we miss getting out of the trap now, we may never again have another chance. Remember, this is our first chance to do so in all the endless trillions of years of the past. Don't muff it now because it seems unpleasant or unsocial to do seven, eight, nine, and 10. Do them and we'll win, LRH. Let's do them and win, the LRH. I'll see you next time. Good night.